Hello, I'm Justine Brown. Welcome back to my bookshelf. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. Today we're talking about William Penn's holy experiment in Pennsylvania. Samuel Pepys considered Quakers to be unhinged. He makes many references to the Religious Society of Friends in his celebrated diary. Pepys describes the yeasty and distinctly marginal religious sect with astonishment and eye-rolling. On one occasion in 1667, Pepys, who worked closely with James, Duke of York at the Admiralty, tells of a notorious Quaker named Solomon Eccles. Eccles was a composer of sacred music who had burned his work in disgust when he converted to Quakerism. That fact alone would have disgusted the music-loving Samuel Pepys. He describes Eccles in full prophet mode. Quote, One thing extraordinary this day, a man, a Quaker, came naked through Westminster Hall, only very civilly tied about the privities to avoid scandal, and with a chafing dish of fire and brimstone for burning upon his head, he did pass through the hall, crying, Repent! Repent! Unquote. Eccles was arrested repeatedly for harassing MPs and others. Elsewhere, Pepys notes that thousands of Quakers are being jailed for illegal assembly. One such was the world's most famous Quaker, William Penn, the man who went on to found the Pennsylvania colony as a haven for dissident sects. Pepys writes, quote, Mr. William Penn, who has lately come over from Ireland, is a Quaker again, or some very melancholy thing, but he cares for no company, nor comes in to any, which is a pleasant thing, unquote. Pepys regretted reading one of Penn, Penn's uh, numerous pamphlets in 1668, quote, so to supper and after supper to read a ridiculous, nonsensical book set out by William Penn for the Quakers, but so full of nonsense that I was ashamed to read in it." Unquote. Why did Pepys bother? The answer is that William Penn was the wayward son of an admiral. Pepys knew his father well. A sticky burr in the tail of the authorities for 20 years, young Penn was nonetheless able to secure a royal charter for a vast proprietary colony in 1681. As I'll explain, the holy experiment, as he termed Pennsylvania, was in fact perfectly aligned with certain elite priorities. As we saw in Apocalyptic Sects and the English Civil War, the Quakers had emerged in the feverish atmosphere of the 1640s and 50s, Puritans, the godly men, had split from Anglicans and then shattered into dozens of smaller sects. The original Quaker was an inspired lay preacher and pamphleteer, a weaver's son named George Fox. The name derived from a habit of shouting, Tremble! Tremble at the word of the Lord! at all and sundry. Quakers embraced millenarian readings of Old Testament prophecy and St. John's Revelation, or Apocalypse, the last book in the New Testament. Like other godly groups, Quakers firmly believed that they were living through the end times, that the second coming was imminent, and that preparation was therefore urgent. English Quaker pilgrims even traveled to Rome to shout at the Pope and got locked up for their pains. Quakers shared certain territory with Puritans, but Puritans shunned them for radical unorthodoxy. The Religious Society of Friends embraced a doctrine known as the Inner Light, emphasizing personal and unmediated experience. In practice, this meant that individuals would gather and simply testify at random as the Spirit moved them. Quakers took negation of tradition to a new level. The group rejected baptism altogether, along with the other sacraments. 
virtually all forms of rite and formal prayer. They referred to church buildings caustically as steeple houses. Radical egalitarians, the friends, rejected clergy altogether in favor of lay preachers, elevated women, refused to doff their hats, and addressed one and all using the vow form reserved for intimates and those one, uh, one wished to insult. Pepys reports a lively exchange between a pretty Quakeress and the king himself, during which she, quote, vowed him all along, unquote. The merry monarch handled such needling with grace. Another time, faced with a Quaker man who refused to doff his hat, the king removed his own hat, saying he believed it was customary on such occasions that someone do it. Quakers also refused to take the oaths required for many forms of service, oaths designed to weed Catholics out of public life. These provocations made the Quakers a great many foes. Coming from a noble naval family, William Penn made a rather unlikely convert to Quakerism, but his elite connections eventually made the American haven possible. He was born in 1644 as the English Civil Wars raged. His father, Sir, Sir William Penn, commanded a ship in a parliamentary squadron, but he remained in touch with royalists. The Admiral played a role in restoring the Stuarts, sailing with the Naseby with Samuel Pepys and his patron, Lord Sandwich, to bring Charles II home in 1660. The elder Penn also made a sizable loan to the king. It was because of these things that he became an MP in the Cavalier Parliament and came to work at the Admiralty under James, Duke of York. His son, a sensitive young man with delicate features, first encountered Quakerism in the person of a wandering preacher called Thomas Lowe, who turned up at the Penn family estate in Ireland. Lowe seemed to offer something which young William sought, a direct experience of the divine, something that George Fox termed an opening. The Quaker preoccupation with authenticity and feeling lays the groundwork for the modern progressives, spiritual but not religious. William Penn went to Oxford in 1660, but was thrown out for nonconformity publicly opposing Anglicanism two years later. His father sent him on the grand tour through France and Italy, hoping to overwhelm William's dissident religiosity. All the expedition seemed to do was make the young man a more stylish radical. Samuel Pepys reports, quote, This day my wife tells me Mr. Penn, Sir William's son, has come back from France and come to visit her. A most modish person, she says, a fine gentleman in pantaloon breeches. Unquote. Soon after that, Penn ran across Thomas Lowe once more and fell back in with the Quakers. He never looked back. Much to Penn Sr.'s dismay, his son began churning out pamphlets at a furious rate. Defying the 1664 Conventicle Act, which had outlawed religious gatherings of five or more outside the established church, William Penn was in and out of prison multiple times over the next 15 years, as were thousands of his co-religionists. Pressure was mounting on the sect and on the government. Without the elder Penn's intervention, there would have been no Quaker haven in Pennsylvania. The Admiral eventually accepted his son's religiosity as sincere. Concerned that William Jr. would be even more vulnerable after his death, Sir William Penn appealed to Charles II. The loyal servant asked the King's indulgence for his zealous son, who argued that Quakers should be exempt from persecution because, unlike Puritans, they were pacifist and did not wish to overthrow the government. Charles invited William Penn to court after his father died in 1670. There, despite his violently anti-Catholic writings, he befriended fellow dissident James, Duke of York, 
whose conversion to Rome had just become public. In 1680, Charles II granted William Penn absolute proprietorship of a vast American territory, making him the largest non-royal landowner in the world. In return, Penn forgave the monarch's debt to his father. The king would also receive one-fifth of all gold and silver mined in the territory. Moreover, the colony would siphon off many troublesome Quakers, making England more harmonious. For his part, Penn believed that God was calling him to create an ideal Christian commonwealth, that this land was the very wilderness God promises in Revelation 12, quote, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, unquote. The name he proposed, Sylvania, or Woodland, evokes this wilderness. Charles II added Penn in honor of the Admiral to make Pennsylvania, Penn's Woodland. We are familiar with the concept of the American colonies as religious refuge. That is a common idea. What is seldom discussed, however, is the way that the colonies served the mother country as laboratories of political policy at a time when burgeoning sects threatened to capsize the ship of state. We can take William Penn's phrase, holy experiment, to describe his Pennsylvania project literally. In 1681, just as he became proprietor of Pennsylvania, William Penn joined the Royal Society. The Royal Society of London was intended for the promotion of experimental natural philosophy what came to be known in modernity as science. It was founded at the Restoration in 1660 by a king who himself possessed a laboratory, as did both former royalist commanders, William Cavendish, Duke of Newcastle, and Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Empirical research was at the top of Charles II's agenda. The Royal Society was Sir Francis Bacon's House of Solomon, in the New Atlantis made manifest. Initially, the members met at Gresham College in London. Writing to a fellow member, Penn expressed satisfaction at the society's progress and promised to contribute from America, which he did in spades. But his holy experiment constituted the Royal Society's most ambitious experiment to date. Elites wanted to see what would happen if tolerance of Quakers and other nonconformist sects was allowed full reign, but in isolation from England herself in what they imagined as the pristine laboratory conditions of the new world. As we saw in the Apocalyptic Sects video, in 1658, George Fox had proposed a stringent Quaker constitution for England, Scotland, and Ireland, but failed to persuade the Republican protectorate to trial it. William Penn's more modest colonial version had a better reception under monarchy. Brandishing his frame of government, which would shape life in Pennsylvania, Penn sailed aboard the Welcome from, um, in 1682. There were about 100 prospective colonists, also known as planters, on board. The welcome headed a fleet carrying 2,000 more men, women, and children. After a rigorous crossing, they landed at the settlement of Delaware, where Penn presented the Dutch and Swedish colonists there the charter granting him sole proprietorship of the whole area. Securing their allegiance, Penn traveled further into the territory. His capital was already being constructed on a peninsula at the confluence of the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers following the grid pattern, which would typify American cities later on. The city was designed to prevent fires, overcrowding, and disease. Each house would have a spacious plot. Penn ensured that parks would abound there. He named Philadelphia the city of brotherly love for the church community described in Revelation in an effort to fulfill the Bible's prophetic structure 
and bring about the millennium. Legend has it that Penn signed a treaty with chiefs of the Lenape tribes under an elm tree. We know for certain that he summoned the freeholders already settled within his borders to a meeting where they were granted citizenship and acquainted with the constitution. The frame of government outlined a legislative structure and promised freedom of worship, along with traditional English liberties, such as representation for property owners and trial by jury. Lying, swearing, gambling, and drunkenness were outlawed. Penn, hating popular culture even more than the Puritans did, banned, quote, idle amusements, unquote, revels, theaters, masks, along with cockfighting and bear baiting. It was the first item, freedom, freedom of worship, that attracted a variety of edgy sects from all over Europe. French Huguenots, German Mennonites, Swiss Amish, and others. Quakers arrived from New England, where they were often prosecuted. English and Irish Catholics were also welcome in Pennsylvania. They could worship freely, but not hope. Uh, hold office or vote. At first, um, the various groups had to worship in barns and makeshift buildings. Gradually, Quaker meeting houses and churches began to appear. Although the frame of government needed several revisions to make it work smoothly, the holy experiment was deemed a success. The Stuarts used American colonies to make the mother country governable. James II, crowned in 1685, took the results of Penn's experiment into account when he advanced his vision of religious toleration at home. Catholics had tried to shelter under the high Anglican wing. Now, James hoped, they could forge an alliance with Protestant dissidents. When Penn returned to England to sort out a border dispute with Maryland, he and his friend James went on a speaking tour to promote their shared vision. Both men had traded in a comfortable existence for religious conviction. James felt confident enough in 1687 to issue his Declaration of Liberty of Conscience, suspending the penal laws against Catholics and other dissenting groups. However, in doing so, the king alienated his Anglican base, the very Tories who had emerged defending his right to succeed his brother, Charles II, on legitimist grounds. And dissident Protestants, instead of allying with Catholics, now joined with mainstream Protestants. William Penn was an exception. He defended James, urging his fellow Quakers to support the king. Penn insisted that James was sincere. He remained loyal to James even when the tables turned completely. The Whigs engineered the revolution of 1688 and William of Orange usurped King James. Penn was actually imprisoned under William and Mary, suspected of being involved in a Jacobite plot. Released in 1690, William Penn returned to Pennsylvania for a time. The colony was thriving though Penn's business affairs were in tatters. His holy experiment ensured that Quakerism was no passing fad like so many shards of the Anglican communion had been. Instead, the religious society of friends would be foundational to the American project. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do comment below and I will see you next time.